Direct from our newsroom in New York, in color, this is the CBS Morning News with Douglas Edwards substituting for Joseph Benty and Roger Mudd in Indianapolis, David Schumacher in Indianapolis, Don Webster in Saigon, Robert Pierpoint in Washington, Robert Shackney in New York City, and Jim Kincaid in Hewlett, New York. Good morning. This is Wednesday, May 8th. Robert Kennedy has won the Indiana Democratic primary. Eugene McCarthy, who ran third, says he's undaunted. We'll have reports from both headquarters and from Richard Nixon, who won the Republican primary unopposed. A veteran senator goes down to defeat in the Ohio primary. In Vietnam, the communist offensive in Saigon is in its fourth day. We'll have a film report. Paris police are guarding the site for the peace talks against student demonstrations. And jockey Bob Usseray talks about Dancer's Image, his disqualified Kentucky Derby winner. This week on the CBS Thursday Night Movies, Gina Lola Brigida at her most provocative, a fiery woman of straw, and Sean Connery in a role that rivals 007. Two people drawn together by a common bond, and between them was conceived murder. Gina Lola Brigida, Sean Connery, and Ralph Richardson star in the masterful thriller, Woman of Straw. And on the CBS Friday Night Movies, the one and only Lucille Ball teams up with Bob Hope in a laugh-loaded motion picture. You know, it's only fair to tell you that I'm the one who plays the title role. What do you mean? I play the critic. Yes, but I'm the critic's choice. Yes, where there's hope, there's laughter, and Lucy makes them louder in Critic's Choice, Friday Night in Color. Senator Robert Kennedy stands a good deal taller this morning as a result of his clear-cut victory in the Indiana Democratic presidential primary. But he didn't knock Senator Eugene McCarthy out of the race, and interpreting the Indiana results is a little like eating a good Irish stew. No matter what your taste, you could find something you liked. Kennedy polled 42% of the vote in his first primary and clearly established himself as a serious contender. Favorite son candidate, Governor Roger Brannigan, widely regarded as a stand-in for Vice President Humphrey, finished a rather distant second, but Humphrey backers issued a statement noting that nearly two out of three Democrats preferred someone besides Kennedy. Even Senator McCarthy found cheer in his 27% showing. He would have settled for 20, he said. CBS News correspondents Roger Mudd and David Schumacher covered the celebrations at Kennedy's and McCarthy's Indianapolis headquarters. Robert Kennedy has scored his first primary victory, an impressive one, the senator called it. It was close to midnight in Indianapolis before Kennedy appeared before his supporters. And could I also express my appreciation to those people in, in the state, uh, in, in Indiana, who supported my candidacy, who went out and voted for me today, uh, which was really, in my judgment, more than a vote just for me personally. It was really a vote for a cause and was vote for a change here in the United States. I think Kennedy said good. he was particularly pleased that he had defeated both McCarthy in Indiana and Vice President Humphrey in the District of Columbia. Last night, Kennedy engaged in an impromptu split-screen television debate with McCarthy. I have traveled all over the state and have uh, talked to all sections of the state and appeared in all sections of the state in small towns and large cities and tried to do the best that I could uh, as I say, uh, I had difficulty here with the Indianapolis Star and the afternoon paper because they virtually blanketed me. So we have to turn to television. If television would cooperate and make this time available, it, of course, would make a major difference and uh, the expenses in a campaign would be changed dramatically. So I would hope that you would take that up with everybody as long as we're talking about I, it. And I'm glad that you asked me the question, though. <laughs> I was, I was, was, Senator McCarthy I, I was wondering if you're glad. Uh, well, no, I'm getting nervous, to yeah. answer. <laughs> I assume if Senator McCarthy uh, would uh, endorse that position. Well, I, I just say that I never really accused Senator Kennedy of buying the election here, Roger. There may have been some who did, but I didn't do that. And the other point is we could appear together on television. We could save half the money, anyway, if we're worried about time and money. 
And if we could get uh, Vice President Humphrey. Why well, is it necessary? We don't yeah, need yeah. three, really. We don't need three. Let it go. <laughs> Nothing really settled about the debate issue, except that it will remain an issue. McCarthy went to greet his supporters. The magical mystery tour, in this room at least, still maintained its magic. There never had been any question of his dropping out in McCarthy's mind, but he wanted to be sure his young admirers were clear on the matter. We've held our own, as I read the results. I don't quite see this as Alice in Wonderland, where everybody has run and everybody has won. I think it falls a little bit short of that. Not everybody deserves the prize in any case, we're sure of that. And so with these primaries behind us and this particular experience, in which we recognize that it's a different kind of contest from here on in from what it was in New Hampshire and also in Wisconsin, we're prepared to carry the fight to the primary in Nebraska and on from there to Oregon and California and South Dakota. <laughs> Senator Kennedy's victory does not sew up Indiana's 63 votes at the Democratic National Convention. Delegates will be chosen by the Brannigan-controlled State Democratic Central Committee on June 21st, and CBS News has learned that those delegates may be picked without regard for the primary results. Well, on the Republican side in Indiana, Richard Nixon, running unopposed, received nearly a half million votes with only about 3% of the precincts unreported. It surpassed by far his 1960 showing against token opposition and indicated that an appeal by Governor Brannigan for Republican crossover votes went largely unheeded. The primary results reached Nixon on the campaign trail in Lincoln, Nebraska, where he evaluated the Kennedy victory. I had heard reports today that Senator Kennedy's uh, margin had been very uh, heavily cut down in the last three or four days by the Brannigan forces. Uh, and so I, th I think it's a pretty good total. I, I don't know, but uh, I had figured Senator Kennedy for a close win. He won by a little more than I thought he would win by, actually. Mr. When Nixon, you... what sort of an opponent do you think Robert Kennedy would be if you were both were to be nominated? Uh, he would be a strong opponent. I mean, after all, you can't knock money. Senator Kennedy picked up 23 convention votes in the District of Columbia primary. A slate of delegates pledged to him defeated two slates pledged to Vice President Humphrey by a five to three margin. In the Ohio Democratic Senatorial primary, 47-year-old challenger John Gilligan, backed by labor in the state Democratic organization, overpowered 72-year-old Senator Frank Lauschi, a conservative who has served two terms in the Senate and five times as Ohio's governor. Gilligan campaigned as the champion of a new generation that he said Lauschi failed to understand. In a concession speech, Lauschi said, I guess the world is changing. Gilligan will run against Ohio Attorney General William Saxby, winner in the Republican race. In Florida, former Governor Leroy Collins on the left here and Attorney General Earl Faircloth apparently will have to meet on a runoff election later this month to determine the Democratic nominee to succeed retiring Senator George Smathers. The winner will face Republican Congressman Edward Gurney, who was an easy winner in the Republican senatorial primary. An easy winner in Alabama's Democratic presidential primary was George Wallace. He can run as a Democrat in Alabama. The delegates pledged to him, presumably, will switch to his third party banner after the Democratic convention. Congressman Armistead Selden and former Lieutenant Governor James Allen will engage in a runoff election next month to decide the Democratic nominee to succeed retiring Senator Lister Hill.
The western portion of Saigon is under a 24-hour curfew today as fighting continues in South Vietnam's capital for a fourth straight day. In the latest action, Viet Cong guerrillas fired 14 rockets into the Tan Sunut airport. Another Viet Cong rocket exploded in downtown Saigon. U.S. helicopter gunships battling Viet Cong guerrillas today reportedly hit a refugee-packed Buddhist pagoda in Saigon with at least two rockets. Ten of the 500 refugees inside were reported killed and another 15 wounded. The communists sent armed propaganda teams into the streets to urge Saigon civilians to join the newest Red Offensive. And since that offensive began Sunday, 2,002 communists have been killed in or near the capital, the U.S. command announced today. Allied casualties for the period included 30 Americans and 181 South Vietnamese killed. For more on the fighting, here's CBS News correspondent Don Webster. The battles up and down Saigon streets continue as dozens of Vietnamese troops try and flush out a few hidden Viet Cong. The better part of two days, the South Vietnamese have been trying to advance down the street. The Vietnamese charge each small house. If they see anything move, even their own shadow, they're likely to fire. It's hard to tell how well organized the Viet Cong raid was. The Viet Cong apparently are not too familiar with these streets. In one of the houses, the Vietnamese uncover quite a treasure. A fort rocket launcher and plenty of rockets. This is probably the most feared weapon the VC has. They've been using it to inflict especially heavy damage lately, stopping even armored vehicles. Then a brief skirmish. One of the South Vietnamese is wounded. While others fire into the houses, he's held back down the street. It's hard to tell in a situation like this who is seriously wounded and who isn't. Some soldiers fall almost without a mark on them, dead. Others emerge like this one, covered with blood, but the wound may be only superficial. Suddenly, the monsoon ranges, and in a matter of moments, it pours. In a curiously Vietnamese way, the war seems to come to a stop. Soldiers who moments ago were risking death ducking bullets are now ducking under cover to keep their uniforms dry. Don Webster, CBS News, Saigon. That six-member U.S. diplomatic team headed by Averill Harriman and Cyrus Vance leaves for Paris tomorrow for initial peace talks, taking with them some tough new American demands and increased concern over the step-up in fighting. CBS News correspondent Robert Pierpoint has the story. The Paris peace talks are in serious trouble even before they start because of what is now going on in Vietnam. High U.S. officials are beginning to question the sincerity of Hanoi for two reasons. The rate of infiltration is now running at its heaviest level in the history of the war, with over 100,000 North Vietnamese troops sent southward since the February Tet Offensive. Secondly, the current communist attacks in the South, as one official here put it, show no intention toward reciprocal restraint to match our limited bombing. As a result, the U.S. position toward the Paris talks is changing, hardening. The U.S. delegation will now approach the talks with firm demands to match what is expected to be an immediate demand by Hanoi for a halt to the bombing. These will include concrete evidence, instead of the previous assumptions, that the communists will also de-escalate. If Hanoi refuses this, President Johnson will not allow what he considers unlimited U.S. patience in continuing restrictions on the bombing of the North. Robert Pierpoint, CBS News, Washington. In Paris, the vanguard of the North Vietnamese negotiating team arrived from Moscow yesterday aboard a Soviet airliner. They were led by Colonel Ha Van Lau, second-ranking member of the team, who told newsmen he was optimistic about the future of the peace talks. The early arrival of the North Vietnamese negotiators apparently means that Hanoi has agreed to the use of the former Majestic Hotel in Paris as the site for the talks. Washington reportedly has agreed to the site, but no official announcement has been made yet. In Paris today, helmeted police wearing anti-tear gas goggles are guarding both the peace talk site and the U.S. Embassy as students and police battle in the streets for a third straight day. Earlier today, police used clubs and tear gas to break up a march on the Sorbonne. Students fought back with paving stones ripped from the street. Sixty students were hurt in the clash, while 22 police suffered injuries. Like father, like son.
think about it. For information on smoking and heart disease, ask your heart association. Columbia University President Grayson Kirk today demanded the immediate return of papers he claims were stolen when students occupied his office during their week-long sit-in. Meanwhile, a five-man independent commission opened its investigation yesterday into the causes of the student protest, a protest that is still going on. CBS News correspondent Robert Shackney reports. Education, some of it of a more or less formal character, has been resumed on the campus of Columbia University but not in the way set out in the catalog, and certainly not the way it was three weeks ago. The student strike appears to have stopped most regular, most conventional instruction at Columbia. Replacing it are a variety of what the strikers call liberation classes. Some of these classes on campus lawns, some in private homes, some of them ad hoc gatherings to discuss politics, some rigidly following the college curriculum, but all outside university classroom buildings. All told, 125 special classes were listed by the Student Strike Committee. Under its rules, it's not breaking the strike. It's all right for professors to teach as long as the class is not held where it's normally scheduled. A class in advanced conversational French. In this confusion, it's hard to say how much anybody is learning. In many of the informal liberation classes, more time is devoted to discussion of strike issues than to academic subjects. Well, no, I, I think this, this discussion is based, upon, is based upon the fact that no, nobody expects immediate changes, and yet everyone knows that there will be general changes over a period of time. Regular classrooms are, for the most part, empty. A good many professors are observing the strike, not appearing in their assigned rooms. And to keep the strike going, student protesters have thrown picket lines in front of most academic buildings. Attendance inside is way down. Only the law, business, and engineering schools report anything approaching normality. A year of college education at Columbia University normally costs $1,900. This isn't the kind of education that parents were paying for. And certainly this kind of ad hoc university education can't go on forever. If nothing else, a spell of bad weather could have disastrous results. But in the face of student rebellion, this is the only kind of education at the moment that seems to work. Robert Shackney, CBS News, on the campus of Columbia University in New York. Owner Peter Fuller charges that someone tampered with his Kentucky Derby winner, Dancer's Image, and he's offering a reward to find out who. His horse was disqualified and placed last after tests showed that the sore-legged thoroughbred had raced under the influence of a pain-killing drug. The disqualification will cost jockey Bob Ussery $12,000. That would have been his share of the winner's purse. But as he told WCBS-TV reporter Jim Kincaid, he still has faith in Dancer's image. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I, I think the horse is a proven horse. I don't think the horse has to prove anything at all. With me, he don't have to prove anything. He's already did enough for himself to prove it to me that he's a great horse. I mean, naturally, there's going to be a lot of... Uh, controversy now whether he was good, a good enough horse to win the derby or vice versa and they come back in the Preakness everybody's going to make if uh, he's a, there's a lot of weight riding on him right now in the Preakness because everybody but to me he's the best horse there's no doubt about it with me in baseball the National League race last night tightened up to the point where only two and a half games separate second place Cincinnati and tenth place New York St. Louis maintained a two-and-a-half game league lead, even while dropping a four-to-one decision to the Mets. Philadelphia beat Cincinnati five-to-two, Houston seven, San Francisco one, and Atlanta two, Pittsburgh one. In the American League, Detroit snapped Baltimore's eight-game winning streak two-to-one, uh, Minnesota two, Oakland one, and White Sox six, California four, Boston three, Washington two, and Cleveland eight, the Yankees nothing. It was the Indians' sixth win in a row and right-hander Luis Tian's third straight shutout. Irregularity. Were you born that way, or is your system different? Some people think normal means daily regularity, so they take a laxative every day. But doctors say normal is what's normal for you. And one of the best ways to help find out what's normal for you is with Xlax. 
Exlax doesn't try to prevent irregularity, just relieve it. That's how Exlax helps you toward your normal regularity, the way your system is. However, age has changed it. If you take a laxative every day, try Exlax for a while, but only when you really need it. Famous chocolate at Exlax. Or now, for people who prefer an unflavored laxative, there's an Exlax pill you just swallow with water. Try it. Rescue workers at Hominy Falls, West Virginia, now say they expect to free at least 15 of those trapped miners today, but chances of finding the remaining 10 miners alive appear slim. Those men are caught in a deeper part of the flooded mine shaft, and so far, no contact has been made. The Vatican announces today that Pope Paul will attend a Eucharistic Congress in Bogota, Colombia, in August. Now, another look at some of the top stories for this Wednesday, May 8th. Senator Kennedy wins the Indiana primary with 42% of the vote. Governor Brannigan, running as a favorite son, was second with 31%. Senator McCarthy says his 27% was better than he expected he intends to fight on. In Ohio, Democratic Senator Lauschie lost his bid for renomination to challenger Gilligan and the combined opposition of organized labor and party leaders. In Vietnam, the western half of the city of Saigon is under strict 24-hour curfew as fighting continues in the capital for a fourth straight day. American negotiators prepare to depart for Paris and preliminary peace talks with Hanoi, but in Washington there's serious doubts about the future prospects of the talks in view of the current Saigon offensive. This is Douglas Edwards, and that's the CBS Morning News. I'm Frank Gifford for Westinghouse. Before you buy a dishwasher, come... This is a WTOP editorial. The marchers who make up the poor people's campaign are underway now. It's expected that in about two weeks they'll be converging on Washington with the intention of staying here until Congress takes some strong action designed to wipe out poverty in this country. Whether the tactics of the marchers are sound or not is probably a moot point, because they are coming and they will be here. But even among those who are basically sympathetic to the overall aims of the poor people's campaign, there's considerable unease about just what is going to happen when all these people arrive in Washington. The unease, we think, is traceable to the air of uncertainty that hangs over the whole project. No one, for instance, seems to know where these thousands of people intend to build their tent city. No one seems to know what provisions are being made for the feeding of this group. It's been pointed out that the logistical problems alone are enormous, like those involved in feeding a regiment of soldiers. And no one seems to have any idea about how the sanitary and health facilities for this huge group are to be set up. That's a very important question. This lack of knowledge is creating a general apprehension could bring about developments counterproductive to the aims of the poor people's campaign. We wish that hard and clear answers could be gotten to the questions we've raised before the marchers arrive. This was a WTOP editorial. Brownlow Spear speaking for WTOP.